Hello, everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero, show where we code complete gave live on stream. Um, I am just going to pick up exactly where we left off yesterday. Uh, there's really nothing particularly specific for us to be doing today other than just trying to get the bugs out of the new Raycaster. And we made some nice little visualizations. So we kind of knew, at, even at the end of yesterday's stream, we had worked it out to a particular place. We are we got rid of some bugs uh, yesterday that were in there as well. So we, we kind of already removed some. Um, but in terms of debugging the Raycaster, you can see we ended up at a place where you can actually visualize the ray. And the bug that I wanted to start looking at yesterday when we stopped was the fact that you can see these purple squares are here, right? <clears throat> um, and these, I should say cubes. These purple cubes are things that, as opposed to cyan cubes down here, uh, maybe I should say magenta. Let's say magenta, because that's what it technically is. So these cyan cubes down here and these magenta cubes up here, you know, as soon as we pass through uh, the structure of the um, land where there actually is something for the ray to hit, we go from a cyan cube to a magenta cube. And even though really the main thing that we have to focus on is why this ray didn't hit right here, because that's where it should have hit, right? This ray is marked as not hitting anything, but it should have hit whatever was right there. The weird part about this is the color coding that I put in the algorithm for drawing these for debug purposes is that if there was something in the region classified as <clears throat> an occluder for rays to hit, it was, cyan, it was uh, magenta, and if not, it was cyan. So all of these are classified as having something in them to hit. And, you know, while these might be true, this is definitely not true. And honestly, I don't think these two should be true either because you can kind of see in here, we have not added trees to our occlusion currently. I mean, we probably should eventually, but right now we don't. We only add like these actual like square blocks, like these things are the only things we actually bother to push down as occluders. And so when you look at what's going on in here, it's like none of these should be like just that one. Like there's just that one should be magenta and none of these should be. So there's two possibilities. One is that our loop uh, is just mistaken about what has occluders in it. And we could go check that pretty easily. The other is possibly more likely, um, although still a little weird, is that just our spatial index build is wrong and it's actually inserting um, things into these cubes saying, you know, hey, there's occluders in here and there aren't. Now, why inserting occluders in here when there aren't would cause you to miss rather than hit, I have no idea. But if there's something generically wrong with our spatial partition build and the things we're adding are garbage rectangles that like are not in the right places or something, then that obviously would be a good way to imagine this algorithm failing. So, you know, there's probably something there. Either way, we need this visualization to be correct because if it's not correct, we know that we've got at least something wrong, even if it's only the visualization code and we would want the fat fix as well. So let's start by just looking at what the problem is here. If we go into the debug code that actually draws this, you can see here is where we draw the ray and this is why we know that we aren't hitting anything as well, even though we know we're not because we looked in the code and never hits anything. But you can see that we're drawing a dim line. A bright yellow line would go to the intersection point and then a dim yellow line would continue on just so we can see where the ray will go. Um, so we know that we're not hitting anything. And then up here, this is where we're pushing. You can see the box color. We say if node start index equals node one pass last index, that obviously means you would never enter this loop because if the node start index and the node one pass last index are the same, you just, you, you'd never have this less than condition. So you'd never be in the loop. It's a top checked loop as for loops are. So what we want to see here is we want to see why is this one pass last in the sequel starting? Why is that triggering only for those things below the level? And when I look at this code, you know, it's checking every time and it's checking the node that it pulls out here. It just doesn't seem likely that this code is broken. I mean, it could be that I'm missing something when I'm looking at it here and, you know, I'm just not thinking about it right or something, but it just doesn't look likely. 
right? It doesn't look likely. So there's a couple of things that I would like to do here. One of them is I would like to just draw these out, right? So as we hit leaves that actually have things in them, I'm gonna draw what the boxes are that we think are in there. That's because I want that anyway, but this will also let me see what the heck these boxes are that, you know, people, like this thing is claiming are in there. And there's some stuff we can do for that actually <clears throat> to help us understand where these boxes are that we can actually use as well. So there's some stuff we can do to improve this. But the first thing I do is just let's loop through these in a separate pass only for debugging where I draw, what are the things that are supposedly in these grid cells that we're collision tasking against. And then what we're gonna do is we'll shift with that information that we'll then be able to see, hopefully something will give us some information, but either way, we'll shift over to the the actual spatial partition build to see if we've got something stupid going on there, because we probably do. So what we wanna do is this exact same thing. We wanna do this push debug box here, but what we wanna do is we want to draw the actual leaves. And what you could see is these leaves come through as four wide, so because they're packed for SIMD. So we've got a three by four X for the min and a three by four X for the max. Again, this is debug code. We don't care about how fast it runs. So we're just gonna pull those out um, individually and we're just gonna draw them one at a time as debug boxes. So this is like an occluder box here and we're gonna generate these by looping through the uh, element index one at a time and we're just gonna draw all four, right? <clears throat> Now, not all four will actually be there because some of these will just be garbage. Uh, like one of the things we do when we pack these things by fours is there aren't always four. Some boxes will only have one, two, three, right? Some cells will only have one, two, or three. And in those cases, the other values are just filled with nothing, right? They don't have anything in them. And so what we should be able to do here is we should be able to just kind of get that uh, occluders out for the ones that are there and the ones that aren't there, well, we just draw garbage. Now we could put an if around it, but we shouldn't need to. It'll just draw like a, it'll draw a, a box off in the middle of nowhere, I believe. Um, and you know, if it's causing us problems, we can put an if around it because we can put into those boxes specific values that we know won't cause collision detection, but then we can actually take those and uh, detect them here. So again, not really concerned about that, but. So what we want to do, oops, is do a rectum and max here. So we want to produce one of our uh, recs for the occluder box. And the occluder box is just going to come from the box min, box max that we already pulled out. But we need to get specific elements from them. So what I want to do is get the element, uh, sorry, component, I think is what we call it. I don't know why we called it that. Um, so we're going to get the component of these uh, that corresponds to this particular index. And that's really all we should have to do. At that point, we can construct a box and pass it on uh, and do anything else that we want to do with it. So if I run it now, I should see something on the screen um, and maybe we'll see nothing because the, the values are just garbage. But you know, the idea would be if we now looked, we should see some boxes. Of course I don't, uh, which is kind of bizarre, right? Like I see nothing in here. Um, so again, kind of bizarre, and maybe a good thing to do now would be to step into that code and see what those values are. Like maybe those values are just complete crap in there. <clears throat> and then there's like nothing that, that you know, uh, that makes any sense, and, and that may be the case. Uh, we'll see. So, so that's at least something. Now I can sort of see like, all right, you know, so something is weird going on here, um, and, and who knows. Um, yeah, and so so I don't really know why that would be the case. So again, that helps us out here because it's just adding to the number of things that we knew were wrong in here, and we would expect to see some boxes in here. I might draw this as a different color just so it's more obvious. Like, let me just draw a white box here so that I can at least see uh, what's going on uh, with with these. If there's anything, if I see any white boxes at all, and, you know, and I don't. Um, I could also, since they will occupy exactly the same space uh, as like, you know, this cube, uh, I could also enlarge them slightly or right, like I could also just to be doubly sure that I'm not missing it, but I don't think I am. Um, I could add a little bit here uh, to the box just so we can see it easier. Uh, meaning I could say, look, let's add sort of a enlargement maybe uh, up to this to this box 
just to make it a little bit larger so that if the problem was that it was just entirely inside the drawn region, which I don't think it was, but let's say that it might be just so we can see it. Yeah, and we, and we don't, right? Like we, we would see it by now if it was there. So I'm pretty sure it's just not, there's not valid data in there. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, switch over to probably debug build and I'll just loop through that code and see why we're not seeing anything. Because looking at the values there will also give me some insight into maybe what's going on wrong in the grid build code, which is exactly the code that we need to be debugging next. So if I switch over to the lighting code now, so over in here. So if I switch over to the lighting code now and I just jump to this part where we push it on, I can just, in theory, stop on the first one and look what the values are. Um, okay. So did I do something wrong with this code? I'm so confused. So in here, we know that we're drawing, <clears throat> or at least I thought we did. Um, we know that we're drawing, uh, in debug mode, it's really hard for me to use that particular um, code path because uh, the game runs so slow when the lighting is put in debug mode because it's you know not being optimized by the compiler at all. Uh, but let me, yeah, I mean, so we're drawing these in magenta, right? Which means that the node start index equals the one past last index. I'm sorry, doesn't equal. Which means this loop has to have occurred. I mean, th doesn't that piece of code require this? Oh, no, it doesn't. If one past last index was simply less than start index, that would explain it. Let's take a look, shall we? Well, there you go. So no big mystery there. I thought our code in the spatial partition build correctly uh, adjusted those values, but guess what? It obviously doesn't because we just watched it not. So what you can see here is <clears throat> uh, in this piece of code, well, there you go. So, yeah, <clears throat> one of the things that um, I know that a lot of people watch John stream for, I don't know if John's here today, he's probably not, I haven't seen any naysayer 88 comments, but one of the things that John often tells people uh, is how to succeed in the game industry. I know a lot of people want to know how to succeed in the game industry. If you want to succeed in the game industry, the important thing to do is to make sure that you update one pass last index before start index. So, um, <clears throat> if anyone's watching his stream at the same time right now, someone says he's live, uh, you can jump over there and tell him that one of the one of the additional things that he may not have mentioned yet, uh, and I'm sure he already knows, but he just may not have mentioned it, as for how to succeed in the game industry, is just make sure you always update one pass last index before you update start index. Um, that's that's really how to succeed in the game industry. Okay, um, so now we should hopefully see th uh, some kind of an improvement there um, in terms of, of at least drawing some of this stuff, but more importantly, we should get to the actual piece of code, I would think. Um, although, you know, apparently that's not true, right? Um, because I'm not seeing anything. So let me see what happens here if I actually jump through to something where that code is, is executing. Did I still screw it up? No, I, mm, I don't think I did there. So that kind of looks like that means we 
never had any one past last index. Um, so what you can see here is that if you add one pass last index to the start index, um, and you know, and to be honest, there's another way to succeed in the game industry. So one way is to do it this way. Another way to, would be to do it this way. So those are two ways to see in the game industry. One is you can update start index first, but then you have to add it outside the divide, right? Another way to succeed in the game industry is to just do one pass last index first. But what's interesting here is what we're seeing is that this count, so that the, you know, the count four here, um, that actual value is coming out to zero apparently everywhere in the entire grid, uh, or at least everywhere <clears throat> that we were looking, which is not good. Um, so this count four value here, where we have one pass last index, we're rounding it, right? So all this is doing is doing a divide with a round. Uh, if we add almost the entire amount, minus one, and then divide, then truncation will basically become rounding up. Um, and the reason we're always wanting to round up is because even if we didn't fill all of an entire bucket of four, we still need to process that bucket. Even if we filled only one of the bucket of four, we still need to. That's why we plus three there, right? <clears throat> so we're just trying to round up um, to the next highest four count. So for some reason, our count four always comes out to zero, I guess, um, which means that if you look at what's happening inside this piece of code, when we are actually doing these loops, somehow we're never getting um, any actual counts in here, which is weird. Um, and I guess the, re well, you know, it's not that weird because if we set it to zero here to start to count, and then you look at the code in here, which actually does it, it would have to increment it. So there we go. Um, so again, really pretty easy bugs to find once we had the visualization, right? Because we knew immediately like what was wrong. So finding the bugs just becomes pretty straightforward. Okay, so now we're in this code and we're actually seeing something that has a occluder in it, which is what we would expect. Let's take a look at what the actual values are um, for our occluder box just to see if they're sensible, right? Because uh, I don't, you know, I don't know. So nothing really weird about that. That's a totally plausible clutter box, so that's good. You know, I just want to make sure there wasn't, you know, garbage in there. Which there would have been because we're putting these in strided, so we could have easily mixed up our shuffle when we went from non-SSE to SSE packing. Um, you know, we could have easily messed it up. So it wasn't a it, it wasn't an idle check I was doing there. I actually was concerned that we might have been placing those things in incorrectly. Um, so we can probably switch back to release mode now uh, and do a little bit more checking of what's going on. But okay, so already you can pretty much see we've improved the performance, uh, uh, not performance, the, the correctness of the code quite a bit because now you can see um, we're actually getting uh, sensible termination, right? It's terminating at the thing it actually hit. Okay, let's keep going a little bit more um, now with the visualization side, just so we can start to see what this code's actually doing um, and try to improve the debugging of it further. So here's me running um, the actual code now. Uh, again, and one of the things you can see is now that we've hit something, we're not actually drawing the ray. Uh, and we, we're gonna need to fix that because obviously we just, in our debug code, we're doing something stupid there. So we need to fix that. What you can see here is if you look at the uh, white regions, uh, because they're inflated by probably a little bit too much, it's a little bit hard to see. That's probably just a little sliver that's on the edge of the cube there. Um, and so I should probably go ahead and uh, reduce the grow amount there. Um, let's, let's see. Um, I don't, 
no, no, okay. So when we draw it in here, I'm gonna say like, let's maybe limit the occluder box, uh, add radius there, we'll get rid of that temporarily. Let's take a look at where we do the drawing. So where do we do that? We do that in here for our push debug line. Probe sample piece single. So it kind of looks like maybe that's buggy. Maybe. Um, so like when we were terminating on a cost metric, which was here, the code was working. Um, when we're terminating on a non-cost metric, which is here, the code was busted. It's what it looks like, anyway. Um, so the production of probe sample P by doing ray origin plus T ray ray D appears to be bogus, or the extraction is bogus. Um, I assume. Because we know this code was working when we had probe sample P single. Um, just being the terminate position, right? Uh, although, um, no, we don't. I mean, this could have been wrong on both sides, I suppose. So I'm, I'm not really willing to say that yet. Let's start with something else. So push debug line solution probe sample P single uh, to, to rate origin single. The only way this code fails is if this is wrong, right? Because if I come in here and say, look, start from the actual origin of the ray, right? And draw it from there. I'm assuming we still see it, right? Yeah. So that's this piece of code. This piece of code is just busted, right? Since we know ray origin singles at the right place, because I just looked, right? I mean, this wouldn't be starting at the right place if ray origin single was wrong. That's exactly where we would expect it to be. Then probe sample P single is the only thing that can really be wrong. You know what I'm saying? So what's going on there? How are we writing probe sample P single and, and why does it seem to be busted? By default, it'll just be at ray origin single. So I think if we fall through here uh, without ever updating anything for some reason, which I guess would happen if we hit the outside. So if we hit the exterior, which would be the spatial grid node terminator, if that's what we hit, uh, then in that case, it would be fine because it would just draw nothing, right? It would just... Yeah, it would never be updated at all. But in all other cases, we'll update it and we should draw something. So the question is, what's that value and why is it busted? Since we have a convenient way to break on debug, I guess we can just switch right immediately back to the debug build and see what are the values, right? So if we go here, um, no, that's erroneous. If we go here, I should be able to see what probe P single is. Uh, so we can find out what the heck, like what value even is it. So it looks like the problem we're getting here, because these are all massive, like infinity style numbers. Um, they're not actually inf, but they're, you know, approaching inf. <clears throat> that looks like what happened is the T value is was not actually updated, right? So, so like the actual value that we picked for T um, is, is just erroneous. And so when we look in here, like we probably came through the T something hit path, right? And what we probably saw when we, because, you know, the way this would be updated is we do the P chef on the T ray to get one out here. We must have been getting the wrong one. <clears throat> so taking a look at that, let's just see what T ray ended up getting evaluated to. Uh, you know, who knows? Uh, 
Okay, so you can see here like T-Ray is just kind of garbagey, right? It's set to the float maxes that it would have been set to if we'd never hit anything. So even though I believe we did hit something, meaning something hit apparently was actually occurring, somehow the mask value didn't correctly update or well no you know the it's probably the p chef b so what probably happened was the p chef b like shuffled something into place that was erroneous right that's probably what happened um and how were we doing that so we've got our shuffle table And the shuffle table is going to pick. The shuffle table is going to pick whatever the min pose thought it should be. So this code, which was really kind of seat of the pants here, it may be time to start looking into that. So. What I kind of need here is I need a debug trap that will occur at the precise time I want to actually debug that. So I'm going to augment that code with something unnecessary so that I can do my debug trap. So in something hit, I want to actually stop specifically on the one we're debugging, just so I'm familiar with what the ray is and what should probably happen to it. And in here, I'm just going to do like a int break now equals true, um, don't actually care what that line says. I know in debug mode it won't get optimized out and I'm just gonna run to that line. So when we jump down here and we stop, okay, didn't mean to have that breakpoint still in there. Let's pretend that wasn't there. Okay. So here in break now, uh, I'm gonna take a look at what happens with the shuffling. So the first thing we do here is we do, uh, um, we do a pshuff b, which for some reason, I don't know why mm shuffle epi8 up here didn't turn into a pshuff b because we made the macro to do this. I, I'll have to look and see why we're not just calling pshuff b, but. So we're doing a pshuff b here, which for some reason is called mm shuffle epi8 in the weird intrinsic world. But it's a pshuff b. Um, the pshuff b is designed to take the horizontal uh, comparison, so min pause epu16. We're trying to use that to compare floats, which technically doesn't compare floats. But basically what we're saying is we don't care about the bottom 16 bits of the mantissa. We just want whichever one is roughly the lowest um, otherwise. I don't really know. I've said this before. I don't really know that that's what we want to do. It's overly clever. Um, in fact, we've got a to do here, right? Uh, that's an example of me saying, look, this may not be such a great idea, right? But who knows, we'll see. Anyway, what we're doing is we're taking four floats and we're taking the high 16 bits of each float and putting it down into the place where we would compare them first. So two, three, that's the high of the first float, six, seven, high of the second, 10, 11, high of the third, 14, 15, high of the fourth, right? Make sense? We pad the end with just the first one, uh, and that way we know that it can't compare favorably against the first one because we don't want any values higher than four, right? Okay, so if we then look at what happens here, so if we take T-Ray P for starters, uh, and what I'll do is we'll just take a look at what the M128F32 components are, so here's what they are. We've got two bounding box hits, right? And two bounding box misses, like so. Now, it's a little bit weird because I don't know why there are two. It would have only seemed 
to probably be hitting only one. And, you know, before I go any further down that path, I would like to just see why that is. Um, I'm curious if that's, like, wrong. Um, I'm thinking it, it probably is wrong, but I, I don't really know. Um, so let me just take a look at, at what's going on. Where does this ray actually enter? Okay. Um, and I guess I can't quite see here, but I mean, it just doesn't seem plausible, right? When you come through here, you're going to hit this one and that's all you're going to hit, right? I mean, you're not going to hit anything else. So it, it feels a little erroneous. So I think, I think we may have a hit bug as well up here. Um, and I'm not sure where that bug would come from because this looks pretty good. Um, I don't know if we screwed up the algorithm somehow when we were modifying it, but like it doesn't look bogus. Um, you know, you can see, right, like here we are checking the bounds to make sure the T-min is less than the T-max and the T-min also has to be greater than zero, which means that max pass, right, we don't care about. That was for testing inside NIST, which we don't care if you're inside because uh, the ray origin just if the ray origin was inside, we don't care about that hit. Um, so we only care about these other hits. And if you look here, you can see uh, that, you know, the the T max and T min, we've, we've gone through these and we've, we've picked the lowest. I, I just, I just don't know. I, I just don't know. That doesn't seem like it should have produced two hits there. So, so one thing we'll have to look at is just, do we actually really believe that we did those two, that those were two real hits, or is this algorithm producing an erroneous result because of something that I'm missing? And that's gonna be something we're gonna have to, to study a little bit more carefully. So let's just keep that in the back of our heads. Remind me if I forget, because on stream sometimes it's hard for me to remember all the things uh, because my brain is too busy like talking to you. But just keep that in mind. So, because I don't, based on that like limited amount of inspection there, I don't feel comfortable with that. I don't think we can write that off. So um, I'm gonna go in here and set a breakpoint on the break now line, and then I'm gonna look at what happens with the shuffle. So here we go. Um, what we should be getting out of the shuffle is two, right? Is what we should be getting out of our, our min pause. So let's just take a look at what happens to the H comp. I'm gonna look, so in the H comp value, um, I wanna look specifically at the U16 counters um, cause that's what we're actually putting into these. So I'm, I'm just gonna look at what these are. And oops, that's M128. U16, right, isn't it? No, sorry, it's 128i. No, i. <clears throat> so when we do this shuffle, we should see these values change. Here they are. Um, and what you can see is we get these two values, which are the two, which correspond to these two t values. And what you can see is they properly correspond exactly the way that I said that they would, right? So. Although we're just taking the high slice of the float, we know that that includes the sine bit and the exponent, and then the first few bits of the mantissa, right? So it's like sine bit exponent and eight bits of mantissa, roughly. When we do this comparison, we would then expect to find that whatever the highest of these are, uh, whatever the lowest of this is, is the, is the closest hit, unless we had two that had the same exponent and the same first eight bits of the mantissa, right? <clears throat> So again, this is just stupid float tricks 101. There is no way to extract the specific float in SSE 4 that I know of. Like you can't check four floats for which one's lowest. That's not a thing you can do. You'd have to actually do your own shuffle horizontal compare basically, which would take forever. So this is just two instructions to do something that would normally take you like six or something, right? Um, so that's all we're doing here. Anyway, 
when we then produce the min test value, um, we're going to see if this actually correctly uh, bingos the float that we were actually looking for. And so if I take a look in here at the uh, U16s that come out of this, no, oh, I must have caps lock on, I can't see. There we go, sometimes I accidentally hit the caps lock key. Kind of wish I could just turn that off. I just never bother to do the like NT um, registry hack trick. I like those keyboards where you can just disable it on the keyboard, it's always good. So we're going to run minpause on this, and what we would expect to find here is that minpause should give us back, first of all, what the minimum value was, and that'll go in slot 0, and then what index it was in, and that'll go in slot 1, right? So there we go, uh, and that answer is correct. So 2 is the correct answer, right? And so you can see that was just me playing it fast and loose with floats there, but it, but it seems to work, right? Yeah, yeah, it seems like it's the right thing. So, so far that algorithm looks like it worked. Shuffle index should now be two, um, unless I messed up the extract. And I guess I did. Oh my goodness. Okay, so extract EPI 16 is taking the 16 bit, so that should be one. All right. If that's the only thing that we screwed up in writing that algorithm, I am pretty happy with that, because that was a pretty crazy maneuver, right? All right, so if we jump over here, oops, I should actually continue breaking there. I keep forgetting that I only want to use this one place, right? We should see that shuffle index uh, should now actually produce, uh, we should, should get the correct value um, out of this now. So let's take a look at min test. There it is, and now the two is coming out properly. All right, I'll try it one more time. Just wanna make sure I stepped through it right because I was kind of not paying attention there. Yeah. So now when we pull out the shuffle table, shuffler, we should get the correct thing. Let's see if that actually happens. So now what we should see is this should be a broadcast. This P shuffle should basically be, a, this P shuff should be a broadcast of lane two to all lanes. So all the lanes should become 11-11. Anyone, anyone out there a Rufus Wainwright fan? Come on, chat. Rufus Wainwright, anybody? Anybody? No? Seriously? All right. Fine. Well, it's 11.11, and if you know Rufus Wainwright, then you would know that 11.11 is a song. <sighs> anyway, uh, so there's the broadcast, and there's that, that worked the way we want. So now our probe sample P should hopefully be the correct value, because the T-ray will now no longer be garbage. I don't really know much about the normal part here. We haven't really looked at that, and we're probably going to have to debug that code as well. Uh, what we can do here is, if we want to, we can start to look at what those values actually are. Um, but, you know, it uh, doesn't really actually matter in this particular case because we're not at that point of debugging. So I'm going to go ahead and say, let's take a look at the diagram again. Oh, dear. No, no, no. I don't know what that was about. I hit something maybe that I probably told Remedy to let the program run, which then, because there's a breakpoint in it, caused it to crash in Windows, which caused it to do the report. I'm guessing something like that happened. Don't hit that key. Okay, so now if we <clears throat> continue running here and we take a look uh, at what we're, what we're looking at. Um, if I look at the Raycast, I can now see that, hey, I'm getting a I'm getting correct result to a certain extent, right? You can see that I'm actually hitting uh, right there, <clears throat> which is what I expect. Um, I'd like to augment here just to get a, a little bit better um, understanding of where the ray is actually hitting. So what I might do here is draw this considerably more uh, muted and actually push a debug box on here where I can just say uh, rect center dim, something like that. And I'll just draw like a, I don't know, a small box 
that's just at the point where we actually hit. So this will just give me like a little tiny like probe point uh, that shows like here's where we think the ray intersected the geometry, right? And so now the ray caster appears to be finding the correct location, like right there it is, it's hitting that cell. Um, and, you know, I don't really know that there's much else we need to prove about it, other than that seems somewhat debugged now, right? I mean, I don't actually know, certainly. There could be lots of other problems, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's close, right? Um, and so we're getting somewhere, hopefully, uh, and we'll see. Now, I need to check the normal, because I don't know if that's coming out correct at all. So we're going to have to take a look at that. And so before I go any further down the road towards trying to make this work well, I'm just going to go ahead and see whether or not there's uh, yeah, any weirdness there. Another thing I would say is it feels like this is the transmission distance is too far. I feel like this value is not good like we're allowing this thing to walk too far or something um i feel like these are opposite you know what i mean like i feel like i feel like this actually wants to be more like that and this actually wants to be more like this um <clears throat> because I don't think we should go very far if we're not seeing any geometry. Like, we shouldn't go super far in that case, right? Um, I feel like these rays should terminate earlier. So, like, this is more like what I would expect. And maybe that's a little aggressive, but I feel like we should probably be stopping before we ever get um, to some of these. So, you know, I'm going to flip those two at least for now um, because I don't think we should be shooting s quite so far as we are. Um, just wasting time uh, and like you know that's plenty of grid squares to check in my opinion for any given ray um, we don't need the light to propagate that far in a single frame and you know so it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense um, so you know looking at the performance of this I wouldn't say that it's particularly good yet um, so you know I don't know how much of an improvement we're actually going to end up getting out of the routine or not but again, like limiting those values should make a difference. Meaning in theory, like we can play with the cost metric to get some savings there. I mean, I don't actually know uh, if we will or won't, but like even that you can kind of see something's a little weird about this because that should have saved a lot of time and doesn't really seem like it did, which is odd. Um, also not sure why that, oh, you know what? Uh, those tables, for some reason, don't compute right on reboot. I think we're going to have to do a thing where we force it to recompute the tables. Um, but it's weird, like, you would expect this number to go down more than it does, which means we may have some overhead stuff that we need to, you know, clean up at this point. And I guess we'll find out as we go. So anyway... I do think we want to play with that stuff a little bit. I'm going to leave it in for now because uh, I want to just use this debugging case, but I do think we kind of want the cost metrics to be adjusted. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put a debug line on here that shows the normal. So I'm going to do a, uh, like a line coming out that shows uh, what we think the normal was. So, you know, kind of maybe a bright orange line there. Uh, that goes from the probe sample piece single um, along the normal, so it's probe sample n single at that point. Um, and we probably need to go maybe just one unit. I mean, that's plenty long enough for us to see the direction the thing is going, I would think. Um, I mean, I guess we'll find out now. So that's the correct normal for this particular hit. Uh, it doesn't really tell us much uh, about other hits. 
we probably need to start um, letting this roam more. Uh, and one thing I could do potentially is just have some way of, of changing what the debug value is. So if I go to grid raycast here, um, I don't know where, I don't know. Hmm. So I don't know exactly what the best way to do this would be. I mean, I kind of want to be able to inspect arbitrary ones of these raycasts and I'm not sure, honestly, um, really not actually sure how I should do that. Um, I guess like, hmm. um, you know, it would be nice if it was just tied to like a value. So I wonder if I could just do something like, yeah, there's like some kind of like um, a, a value in here that I'll just like edit in the debug settings or something. I don't know. Uh, Debug grid index. I don't know. So let's just suppose uh, that we happen to have a debug grid index here um, or something, and that there was like a debug value for this thing. And then like maybe we just have like a lighting output of that of that value. Like this is just me just making up something because I just want to be able to like. <clears throat> I just want to dial in a particular value, right? I and mean, that's all I really wanted to do. So, you know, I don't know if I can do what I'm doing here, but I'm gonna try, right? So just say, look, here's a lighting data and I want this to show up in the lighting data and I just want it to be something you can edit. I don't know if you can edit it, um, I don't remember anything about our debug system other than it was kind of crappy. Um, but, you know, I think we had the lighting in here somewhere. Yeah. And so if you look at the uh, lighting data here, there's a, it, it did work. I mean, there's a debug grid index. I just don't know how you get this to be editable, right? Um, it looks like we... Um, I, I want to say we did allow something like that, though. Um, so, like, debug B32 allows you to edit it, right? <clears throat> debug UI element. thing worked it was pretty dumb um so like i have no idea what most of these things are i definitely don't know why this is editable and this is not um although i would suspect it's probably has something to do with this um, meaning we probably just implemented editing for beats. Did we? I don't know. Let's take a look. So those have nothing to do with editing. Those do. Okay. So R32s had a drag value interaction, but but integers didn't. I guess that was it. So if I just make a drag value interaction um, for these, then I guess it would just work. I mean, right? Which means what? Like debug type U16? I mean, I guess I could 
use just U32 because that's probably more what I'll typically want. And we'll just make the thing, our thing a U32. I don't think I want that to be Y. I think I would rather it be X. <clears throat> Maybe. I'm totally just making this up here. Um, I also don't know if D mouse P. I don't know what this is going to do. <clears throat> so I don't really know what this is going to do. Probably nothing good. Um, and this probably wouldn't work. I mean, you don't really want to do it this way because you want to sort of have a... You want a smoother interaction than that, but... Oh, well. Arg. Okay. So in the actual, um, oh, you know what I should have done? Actually, um, you know, why am I doing this? There was really no reason I had to do this. This was dumb. Don't do that. Just make the debug value in here be, I'll just make this value be a float. Because then I can have smooth dragging as well. And yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's what I should have done. Right, that's the smarter thing to do. And then what we can do here is just say, look, round it there. <clears throat> that way we can have smooth dragging and it'll work. All right. So now, if I take a look at what happens, I think in theory, I should be able to move this value I don't know why that's so, I don't know why that's so finicky there. Like, see how it kind of jitters? It's probably just, again, the debug system being crappy. Um, but at least now we can sort of move it around, right? Like I can sort of, uh, and I also, because these are where they are, I feel like X would be a way better drag than Y, right? I feel like that would be better. But I don't know why it like shakes between those two. Probably just again crappy debug code or something. It doesn't really matter. It's it's the debug crap which can stay crappy. Yeah, it's really weird how that behaves. But so that's pretty easy for us to change. Um, and at least we can see that from underside hits, it tends to be about the same. Um, we probably need some way of like entering values in here at some point because these will be really hard for us to to get larger because they're going to be quite large. The number of grid squares is, is kind of way too large, right? But um, that's all right. So in here, let's say I just do like, I don't know, 10 times that. <laughs> Although actually, let's do five times that. Okay, uh, so now I'm not sure where we are in the grid, but I'm just going to try and see if I can. There we go. Um, so it looks like that's still too far, though. Like, I don't want to be quite so high. So let's do two times that. Uh, well, maybe three times that, let's say. I want to be in the actual environment, you know, with my test. So I'm just going to just kind of try to find a way to, to get there. Why am I not seeing that? There it is. <laughs> okay. So that's... <clears throat> I can't quite tell where is that actually casting from. 
It's casting from this square. Looks like. So that's actually good. That's in the environment. That's what I want. So I'm going to move this square to like here. Maybe inside a little bit. There we go. Okay. So let's try maybe one up from here would be a good casting location. Because, you know, looking at this, it's like... It's like not clear. Also, this that seems to be going backwards. I think there's a lot of bugs we can get out of picking a good spot here. 14.889. I'm going to just record that grid index in here just as a note. But then I think what I want to do is take 14.889... Um, as a debug index here, and then I want to add to it the actual, what, I want to move that one sheet up. So I don't remember, it should be 24 by 16, I want to say, is how big the voxel is. So that should give me basically that same location, but like one up, <clears throat> right? Okay, and then if I run this uh, and we look, I was hoping I would get, well, so I guess I screwed up that stepping, is that? Oh, but it's actually 24 by 17, right? Because it's one large, oh, sorry, 26 times 18. It's actually one larger uh, around the whole border. So the sheets are, yeah, it'd be 26 by 18 per sheet. Wouldn't it? as I say, as it totally obviously isn't. Um, did we do different stuff? Oh, we, and yeah. I keep forgetting the spatial partition is totally different than the voxel. It's not the same because we, we raycast against larger areas than we do. So I don't remember what this is. Let's just do it. So if we actually take the grid itself, so the solution, Spatial grid, because I don't remember what the values are. And we just do x times y. <clears throat> uh, what is it? Cell count? That should actually work. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I could not remember, like, the stuff we decided about the spatial grid was pretty tweaky. Um. All right, so now we're in the right location. That's the cast I wanted. It's casting off to the top, which obviously doesn't help. Um, and that's fine, because now we can move on to the next thing I wanted to do, which is I wanted to have in the, oh, I know why. This code's multi-threaded. That's why we were getting the twitch, the twitchiness there. That's why. Um, so that makes sense. Yeah, you can't really do this here. I guess, so you know what? I could fix that by just making this, put this in the solution and output it only at the end. So why don't we do that? Because, hey, it was really annoying to, to use that way. Um, having many threads querying what happens there and overwriting each other. So you know what? Let's, I think that's probably what we were seeing there. So let's just put it in here. Debug grid index and debug ray index. We'll just put them there. Um, and then we can have this be solution debug grid index, and I'll move this down to the single threaded part of the code, right? That seems fine. Okay, so let's say this is debug grid index. Let's say this is, um, debug ray index, these are going to be off of the solution itself and stored there. And then these will be set somewhere uh, in the initializer like so. 
And what we will want to do here is the debug ray index. We kind of had that in the uh, place where we call. <clears throat> so you can see here when we produced the debug, um, it was like plus 36, right? Um, so let's actually just hard code that into this spot instead, and then we can round this one solution um, debug ray index, right? And we need to clamp this, like we can't let it free roam uh, for obvious reasons because it will fetch out of bounds here. Um, so what we really wanna do is we wanna make this correspond properly to that. I could put this in here um, but I'm not gonna. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm just gonna say, all right, let's bound it. <clears throat> so the debug ray index is less than zero. We'll make it equal to zero. And if the debug ray index is greater uh, or equal to, or I should say maybe just greater than the l um, than the total, which honestly, I don't remember what it was. Total light sample direction counts, I guess would be the thing, right? So that'll just keep us in the in the clear. So now, if I actually run this, um, there we go. In theory, I should be able to pick a ray direction now too, right? So if we take a look here, we can at least start to look at some other things. So there's us casting a ray, um, hitting a volume. It looks properly clipped. There's the bounce back right there. Um, and that's correct as well. Um, so that's, like does look kind of correct, but odd in a certain way. Like having these things right on the edge is probably not great. Like we should probably clip to a certain dimension because we don't really care if we have a few holes in our system. So we're probably testing too many things here, but I guess that's beside the point. Anyway, if I look and see what's hitting there, it, it really does look correct. Um, you know, the problem we're having now is the lighting is not right. It's doing a weird flood fill thing, right? But at the same time, like the Raycaster looks like it's working properly. So that's a little bit unnerving. So if we see, so if we see an intersection there, I'm guessing that's the light that's right here that we're hitting. But at the same time, I should see it. So that seems buggy, right? Like, what is happening? That seems just totally wrong. I'm gonna go ahead and say that our T-terminate case is broken. This was clearly a case where we terminated and we produced a reverse answer. So let's capture this, 16, 3, 17, and 42. And let's just look at that case. So 
So that was 16, 317, 42. Okay, <clears throat> so now I should be able to look at this case and debug this case because it's pretty obvious that something's busted. Um, and I think it's the t-terminate. We should take a look at the compute walk table code because this code here uh, is actually producing <clears throat> the t-terminate values. And I'm wondering if they're just wrong somehow. Let's take a look. So here's the code. Um, you can see that the, the location that we cast from was here. And we cast out into this direction. We terminated out here somewhere. And somehow recorded this as the hit. But the the hit should have been like like here, right? So super messed up. The T terminate value looks negative. And I guess I can see why. It's because we're now shifted properly to account for going along the cell dim. Yeah, okay. Um, that totally makes sense. So I guess what we really need here is probably something more like this. We probably need to set t terminate to zero. Every time we take a step, we probably add t best to it. I guess. Seems sort of sane as a way to do that. Um, let's double check. So there you can see our T terminate stopping properly. Um, I don't know that we really need it to stop in that way. It probably could stop in the middle here. So, you know, there's, there's some of that. But at least we got rid of that that bug, right? Because um, that was obviously wrong, and, and now of course we can see that it's it's working properly now. Um, I don't really know why. I still don't really know why that drag behavior is going that way. Because now I'm not calling it multi-threaded, so we don't have that excuse anymore. So yeah, looking at this, I mean, it just I don't know looks like a pretty good ray tracer now that's early outing we should probably draw when we early out versus when we don't um but like that's like what you would expect to see pretty much everywhere so i'm not now sure why we're not getting good results <clears throat> uh in terms of the actual light because it's obviously hitting an error case pretty quickly, and you can see the whole world floods in an odd way. But everything else, you know, it looks fine. So actually, like, the Raycaster seems pretty good now. Um, there may be some case we're not seeing, but that seems pretty good. So does that mean that our, our actual write back is busted, right? Um, or, you know, is there something else that we're doing stupid? I don't know. But it seems like the Raycaster actually is looking okay. Now, it could mean that, you know, if you take a look at this code, here's the old Raycaster, and you can see, like, this was the part that actually generated the write back to the uh, spec mask, spec texels. That code's been completely changed here. So, one thing that could be wrong is this code, because we have no idea. We could have just totally screwed this up, right? <clears throat> and so if that's the case, looking at the, um, just looking at this part of the code and figuring out if, if we need to debug this could be part of it. This should be identical 
Unless we're passing the wrong actual spec texel, this should be fine. So I think it's mostly this code that would be suspicious here. So we can start here and we'll just see if we step through some of this code. We'll just see if we're producing plausible, you know, after the, like the reflect color foo comes back, does this stuff look at all right? Or is it totally busted, right? Um, I think that's what we want to do. <clears throat> okay. And so again, the reason that I'm concerned about this is because um, although we haven't done our light quality pass, so our lighting is still kind of needs to be looked at in terms of the actual computations. Um, this should actually also be if lighting use grid. <clears throat> there we go. Um, so if we look at what happens if we run the old ray tracer, we are getting like plausible lighting with the old ray tracer and we're not getting plausible lighting with the new ray tracer. So like when we switch to the new ray tracer, um, like so, uh, we get this sort of gradual brightening that just ends in full bright, right? It's very strange. So, and like, it just looks very odd. So it feels like even though the raycaster seems like it's properly raycasting, at least to some extent, the sampling is maybe busted or something, right? Because you know, the raycasters are a little bit different, but we wouldn't necessarily expect that big of a difference from switching between the two raycasters. We would have expected similar sorts of results. And that's not what we're seeing. So let's take a look at the code that actually exits out um, when we do have a hit, because that's the part that, like, at least I would think, is implicated the most in this case. Um, it's especially implicated the most in my mind because we wouldn't, when the old ray tracer hit nothing, um, the old ray tracer would have reported mostly skylight results at that point if it hit nothing. This ray tracer will be, should, if anything, because it has early out in it, should be slower to report skylights because skylights in this case should only happen once you actually propagate inward the skylight a little bit. So it should, if anything, be slower to go full bright, but that's not what we're seeing at all. So we, yeah, we should probably, and you know, maybe that's wrong because maybe what happens is the skylight propagates into the outer region and then the diffuse blur adds energy because like we did it wrong. It does seem like the diffuse blur adds too much energy right now um, for whatever reason, even though I'm not sure why. Um, so I don't know. Uh, it, it, it could just be something like that, but I think there's still bugs in that. I don't think that would completely explain it. So I'm gonna go ahead and assume uh, that we've got a bug in here and that we want to go through this code like with a fine tooth comb at some point um, just so we can kind of determine what's going on. So if I go to the grid raycaster and look at the fallout uh, place, you know, where we, we go, okay, we hit something and we uh, take a look at what the results are in here. As far as we can tell, we're computing the normal correctly. When we then go to extract the probe uh, singles, we drew those and they did appear right. The emission direction in this case is the opposite direction uh, of the ray. It appears that we pretty much always do that. So, you know, that may be something we want to simplify later. We need the compute voxel rating set to get a little smarter. It's not even using the emission direction, I don't think. But anyway, so when we come, um, 
into this reflect color foo case and we do uh, this operation, we know that these two values are right because we looked at them. Uh, and those are the two values that we're actually going to use. So we, we assume that reflect color foo comes back properly. The reflect fall off is the inner product between the sampling normal and the emission direction. Um, so that's how much it should be sending back at us, right? Uh, and like I said, I think that should probably be done in here. That's I think why it was being passed in here in the first place. So I don't know that this is, wants to be done here. But either way, that's okay. We modulate by that, which is what we would expect to see. Um, we then do a... Uh, we then do a loft of the color of RGB up to a 4x and we do a hit emission shuffle to find out the emission level and then we just like max those two so we we take whichever is higher the emission or the reflection <clears throat> seems plausible and then we just extract um So I guess what we're doing here is we're doing a PSHF B on the hit ref color, which would be the modulation level uh, for reds, greens, and blues. And then we're, um, and then we're just multiplying by that transmission to get the final transmission. Honestly, that seems fine. It's a little convoluted. Um, again, I think probably what we want to do is get compute voxel or radiance at just taking wide values to begin with. Even though it can't really do that, the rest of the stuff it should do should probably still stay in wide. So you probably want to look at that a little bit later. But, it, you know, it looks fine. Um, transfer PPS in this particular case. What? What's going on here, folks? This, this is not... So I don't, this is not shuffled properly, I would wager. Um, I'm, I'm not feeling great about this. Like, so if you take a look at where the spec Texel stuff happens, um, so what you could see here is the transfer PPS is getting sliced out as RGBR, GBRG, BRGB. So we're doing three wide ads to do four pixels. Does that make sense? So you can see that slicing happening. And this is the same code, right? We just duplicated this code. This is how it is working in either case. But that means that the transfer PPS has to be set up such that the transfer PPS itself is RGB, 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 right? I don't know what the heck this is doing, but we have to make sure that it lines up that way. And I'm not sure at the moment that it actually does. So I want to actually verify that because I'm like, huh? Right? So taking a look at transfer PPS to begin with, the first thing I can tell you is that if I actually look, um, so transfer PPS up here is four wide and we're only writing to one of them. I think when we like looped in this code, we just didn't do this, right? So the moonlight's getting written to three channels whether we wanted it to or not. 
So that's just straight up bogus and not good, right? Um, so at the very least, this would have to look like this. At the very least. And at that point, if this actually is doing a full extraction of what the hit should be for this one hit, then that does seem uh, at least more plausible. That did not help to be to, at the risk of saying the overwhelming obvious, but I think that's what should have been going on there. So now we're writing to all four of the transfer PPS channels. The red, the green, the blue, the red, the green, the blue, the red, the green, the blue, right? Um, and in this case here, this clamp wouldn't do anything um, because this here will always actually happen, right? Um, so like this never happens, ever. Which would be bad, and this is again like, we don't have a way of getting those answers in here. I guess we sort of do, in the sense that we can force that to happen in the in the zero out case, if we wanted to. Um, So we're going to have to think about that. The other thing I would say is, <clears throat> in this case, where we hit the node terminator, um, it seems like this code is just broken. Like, who's going to set probe p single at that point? Like, nobody, like nobody. Right? So when you miss, like this has to get updated. So I think we've got some issues. Um, I think this has to happen in a different way. I think what we actually need is something more like that and then this code has to be the code that actually does the early out. So it's like, you know, if the cost metric got too low or the start index, then update these, right? <clears throat> so they're always correct. Um, that seems like more what you want. You know what I mean? Uh, and so I think now we're a little closer to correct. So now the question is, why are we getting this full braiding here almost immediately, right? Like what's going on there? And now I think we can start to step through this code and investigate what's going on. But I'm pretty sure this is, that was just wrong to begin with. And we need to look at what's going on um, now that we're actually creating real transfer PPS values, right? Um, Okay, so let's take a look now at what happens there. And I guess I wanna maybe pick a debug, a specific debug location. Um, I guess this one's fine because it's gonna pick a place to sample that doesn't have anything. And that's probably okay. Um, Probably am I, uh, hmm. I don't really know. So I'm not sure what I want to do for the next event. I don't know how much time do I have left. I have two. Two 
till two? Does anyone know when we started? No one knows when we started. So I don't know exactly how I want to proceed. Um, and somehow the like speed is really slow right now as well, right? Like it's it's kind of weird. Like something something bad happened when I did that, and I'm not really sure what it was. But it's like really unhappy now. Oh, wow. So actually, it's not really unhappy now. It's actually quite zippy, but as soon as I turned this on, like, it got much slower, somehow. But not now. Why did it get so slow there, right? It was very slow, but now it's not. What happened there? Did anyone see? We should go back on the replay and see. It was very strange. <laughs> Look. Are we leaking some memory or something? Did you see how bad that got? Weird. What the heck? So something is up, because here we are running it, honestly, like, getting very close to 60 frames a second there, right? We're 30 pegged, um, for sure, but then all of a sudden we drop into no man's land, and I don't know why. Like, if we took out the frame display, look at that, look at that. Are we having some kind of run-in with denormals? Denormals should be turned off, shouldn't they? I don't know what could cause that. What's the, um, what's the memory usage? Let me just see. Isn't there some way to get the, um, we're not leaking. That's a stumper. Really interesting. So I don't have any idea why that would be occurring. My only guess is somehow it has to do with bogus numbers. I'm totally stumped as to what would cause such a thing to occur. Because I would have thought that bogus numbers would not be going on at the moment. Um... Meaning we would have our denormal flush to zero and all that sort of stuff would be gone. That's really bizarre. That's really, really bizarre. But it's very reliable, right? And it seems like it has to do with with uh, the longer you run the lighting for. Like something's happening, right, to the values. And 
this is the kind of thing on the x87 that you would immediately just go oh denormals have hit and now you're you're screwed but i wouldn't have expected there it is right there right i wouldn't have expected that to be relevant to us so i'm curious now what what on earth could we be doing that would create such a thing let's continue debugging further and see if we see any signs of what's going on here um well you know what i could do too um i can maybe nerf this let's say that i do some uh creative like nerfing here and just blend in zeros periodically right so like um <clears throat> and i'm gonna do this just to make it harder for the optimizer to remove the rest of this code. So this is me sort of forcing the transfer values to go away, right? Um, so now, like, you can't accrete a denormal number anymore because I'm not letting it do that. Um, and I'm just curious if we still get this problem. <clears throat> So looking suspiciously like it does not happen if you don't allow blending accretion, does that mean we still have denormal numbers in play? Nah. It can't be, can it? I mean, that looks rock solid, right? I mean, it looks like an unusual number, uh, uh, like a bad numbers problem. If you don't allow it to accrete, you don't seem to have that problem. And I don't know how else you can have that occur. So if we don't do that, right? And I do the same thing. Well, now, now we're not seeing it again. Oh, oh, there you go. Bam, it just hit. Right? So let's prove to ourselves that this is a bad numbers problem. Here's how I'm gonna propose we do it. In the case where we actually hit our debug, <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and dump that cells uh, values. And so I'm going to go like this. I'm going to come out here and I'm going to actually like see what those, what our values are trending towards. So I know that I have just only one cell, so it should be fairly free for me to just like, if we're doing the one debug case, 
out of this one cell, I should be able to go ahead and do a debug block here where I just output like what the values actually are, right? That should be pretty straightforward. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Um, so in here, like I should be able to say like debug this value where the value is like whatever the spec texel value is. So like if we look at spec texel dot value, in this case, I should be able to just output any one of those, right? Because the spec texel itself is just a V3. So like, you know, that should be um, the four values that are in this particular location of the spec map. And honestly, we just, we don't even probably need that. I'll just look at the zeroth one and see. I mean, if I don't find it, I'll look for more, but zero should be fine. If we run it now uh, and we open up the lighting area, we should see, um, and we don't. So somehow I'm not seeing this hit. Um, That should be pooting forth, uh, but it is not pooting forth. And I don't know why it's not pooting forth, right? I mean, like I should be seeing, seeing that value and I'm not. Is there an error in here? No. Like that should poot forth, shouldn't it? I don't know why that wouldn't poot forth because debugging, oh, because we, mm, yeah. Well, you know, it's okay because since we know this is an endemic, it, it's, it persists over frames, I should be able to do it here, right? So I should be able to, to poot forth before I turn off my debugging because we loop multiple times over the array, right? So I should have it poot forth. Um, it should be able to poot forth a little bit earlier than that, right? There we go. What the heck? So we just have complete garbage going into these values. That would not really explain this behavior, meaning those look like actual zeros. Maybe they're not, maybe they're actually tiny numbers and we're just, because we're only printing out the first six places, maybe they're getting down towards underflow and that's what's happening. I also don't understand why is everything full bright if these are all zero, right? Like what's going on there? It's fascinating though. So we're definitely getting to the heart of the problem here, which we obviously have and just don't understand. But let's see, I assume all four are basically the same, right? Like I assume we're getting the same things in all four of these. Uh, but I don't actually know. Yeah. Oh, how interesting. How very interesting. So our mid two are not having that. They're not flushing to zero. And I'm guessing they do at some point. No, we get slow even before they do. How odd. All right. So we're clearly in no man's land here. Like we're, we're in a place where we don't really understand it at all what's going on. So there must be some issues in this particular part of the process where we're actually doing these assigns here. Um, There should be no way to, oh, well. No, but there should be no way for transfer PPS to ever not get initialized, right? In other words, if I do this, we shouldn't be in a situation where, 
Nope, that's not true. So in the case where we did debugging, we wouldn't, no, we still do the loop. So we shouldn't actually, if I initialize to zero, that should change nothing. Meaning this is the problem we just have, right? The code is broken in the interior. So it wasn't like it wasn't getting updated. This should, this doesn't need to happen. It always does actually get updated, right? So I guess um, we're at the point where we need to start looking at why this doesn't work. So let's just step through it. That's very interesting. I think we must be having a denormal or other unusual numbers problem. I can't think of any other way that we're getting that slowdown. Um, it'd be nice to verify that, but I can't at the immediate moment think of how other than maybe to test. We could write something that looked looped over the whole set and looked for denormals or other unusual numbers like is unusual. We'd have like a call. Um, that would determine that. But since we already have numbers that are completely bogus, I guess I can start there at least and just see how we're ending up with these transfer PPS values that are so obviously completely messed up. Um, and we'll see. Okay, so if we look at the transfer PPS values to start with, even though I didn't initialize them to zero, they are already zero here before they're actually getting assigned. Um, when we actually uh, step through and try to assign to them here, well, you know what? I can't actually view them because we're multi-threaded. So let's turn off the threading real quick. There needs to be a good way to step through multi-threaded code where it only steps the one thread. It'd be really cool if there was some way to do that. Does Remedy have anything like that? X13 pixels probably isn't on right now, but is there some way in Remedy you can just step just the one thread you're looking at? Um, on the list, okay. That would be a pretty huge help here. Like Visual Studio always sucked at that too. Like it couldn't do it really. You had to like freeze threads manually, it was, it was bad. But you could imagine a debugger having sort of an advanced system that helped you where you could just say, look, only step this one thing and it would go freeze all the threads for you, allow you to step and then like unfreeze them when you then said step them all or something. I, I don't know. Like it, it does seem like something a debugger could do for you. It's just, I'm used to not having it because Visual Studio didn't have it. It it had this weird like freeze system that's that was that's super sucky. Um. Anyway, uh, so all I want to do here is say, like, look, the lighting queue, um, let's turn off the multi-threading by nerfing the ability to pass that to lighting core. So lighting queue equals zero, I guess. We'll just put that there. Um, and so now we should only be stepping through one code path. Uh, So here's the transfer PPS, um, and uh, now it's actually non-zeros, right? These are the values that we would expect because we didn't initialize it, so it should just be garbage. Um, when we step in and see what it is, it's just the RGB is nothing at that point. Um, so that seems fine. That wouldn't cause us a problem, would it? Like, why would that be bad? So let's go out and look at this part of the code maybe just to see what the heck's going on here. So if I jump to here uh, and I look at all of these values, like it's just zero, there's nothing in transfer PPS. Um, so what's spec texel at that point? So here's the spec texel and the spec texel value for each of these. So yeah, I don't know what, what's the problem here? So the spec texel is totally fine the first time through anyway. Like, when does it get bad? What's going on? 
I mean, that looks like all zeros to me. Right? So how did it get, how does it get to be ridiculous? I think I, I'm just too lost with what is causing this problem. I don't have a solid idea. So I feel like what I wanna do is write some augmentation code to help me. So like, remember we had is fishy, um, or it looks fishy, where like a, if a number just got weird, um, it would tell us. Kind of think that we saved this for a good reason. I'm just gonna ask this thing anytime we just produced a fishy value in here, I want to know. So just look at these um, and do an assert um, on each of these. So that will just tell me like, look, when does this go wrong? Because it obviously does, but it's not obvious when. So maybe if we could just catch the point in time when it starts to look fishy, we could figure out what the heck was going on, right? And, you know, I don't know. I don't know when. Um, you could see the first few frames there looked good, too. So something's up there um, with those numbers. They're, they keep sort of increasing very rapidly there. And now we've gotten to a fishy, you know, a fishy situation. So they do start well behaved and they just go too high. And so something about the way we're outputting the transmission here, I guess, is erroneous. Um, and boy, is it. Um, so I guess that must have something to do. <clears throat> I guess what I'd like to do here is let me look at what we're producing for transfer photons per second values for just the debug one, because that way I can look at them manually. There's way too many to look at manually otherwise. Like those values all look good, right? Is it just a feedback loop problem? Yeah, it is. So the problem that we're getting is that the lighting just keeps increasing and it obviously increases by more and more power each time because it's storing more and more power. Um, very interesting. So this looks like a case of just the, the diffuse blur problem. You know, like that suggests that, that if you just were looking at sort of like um, hacking this stuff, uh, that means if you just turn down the transmission, you would be fine, right? And so we, we kind of want to know why we're getting that. And if you remember, we already have this problem. So if you look at the diffuse map builder, you know, this is uh, some garbage here, right? Um, and so if you imagine just doing, you know, more removal, um, like a very low transmission value, does this all of a sudden work? Which again, like gives us a good clue um, as to what the heck is going on. So let me take a look at what happens uh, in that circumstance. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. That's not what I wanted. I want this. Those look like they're flattened a little bit much, but but you can see, so even with really damped transmission, it still looks sort of feedbacky at this point. Um, I guess it's a little hard to say, you know, maybe not exactly, but I'm just trying to find out if this feedback is, is just a lighting quality issue feedback 
and there's a slight difference in the ray tracer that, that that would produce it or if it's if it's a little different let me run it quickly I think we're in a good shape though we've we've gotten rid of a lot of the bugs so I think at this point we're now just down to like looking at the actual PPS preservation and sampling um, let's see what happens when we do this quickly uh, It, and like, look at how slow that is for some reason. But we don't know why that would be slow. It's like the fact that the numbers are low produces slowness, which suggests to me that we have a problem with denormals. I just don't understand. So you can see like even with really gradual, it just it just transmits too much, right? So something's something's still broken there, I think. Like look at how that goes. It just it's not preserving the energy. Sure does look kind of cool though, huh? But um it's just not properly preserving the energy. So that's fine. We're pretty close. Um, we can go ahead and start looking at that. Uh, that's so cool looking, by the way. <laughs> um, how neat. Uh, anyway, uh, so I think we just have a few more issues left in the way that we're producing that transfer. That's just so weird. How fascinating. <laughs> so I think, yeah, we're just having problems with, again, and so maybe now is the time to like do the lighting quality pass as well, but it's just very strange. Look at how slow that is by comparison to what we know that it was running the exact same algorithm, doing the exact same number of iterations. It's just very suspicious. So we're kind of at an interesting point in terms of suspiciousness here, right? Um, so anyway... And what we, pr what we probably want to do, right, um, we probably want to check for denormals. I th don't know if there's some... I just don't know exactly uh, whether we're allowed to actually set these. Uh, we want flush to zero and denormal to zero uh, stuff to happen. I just don't know um, what those are set to. I would have assumed that they were already set. I guess I didn't know that they wouldn't be. Um, so that's a bit weird. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'll just try setting these. Oh, so this can actually be a compiler flag, apparently. So is this actually an option I can set in Visual Studio's compiler at all? Because this is talking about the Intel compiler. Um, and I don't know if Visual Studio has a similar thing. I can set them myself. So, you know, we could do that. Um, and we could just see, uh, I assume these are in the actual intrinsic guide. They might not be, but the control word for the... Um, for the SSE stuff, presumably, uh, can can be <clears throat> can be set pretty easily. I, I don't remember having done this in a long time, but it shouldn't be that bad. 
Um, it's kind of too many things here, and I, and I don't know exactly what they would have called it because I don't remember. Um, but let me just see if I can search for control. Extended control register kind of sounds related in this case, but uh, unfortunately I don't actually know. Um, so this is what we're talking about. Like this is the sort of stuff we're looking at and we just want to be able to set those and we should probably just, yeah. So, so here's here. Okay, here we go. This is the thing I was looking for. MM set CSR. That's control register. Um, so presumably I only care about setting the exceptions. Um, and setting the flush to zero. Let's see what happens. I'm just curious now. Let's see what happens if I do that. So if I say, um, you know, I'm assuming that this is the correct uh, MM set CSR. Let's just see if I do MM set CSR for denormals. Like, does someone have a nice guide uh, to that? Because someone should have said so. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> so this is this is basically what we want, right? Um, basically, it's just oring in the bits we actually care about, and it looks like you probably don't actually have to do it as bits necessarily, but this is what we want. So we want to literally do exactly what this does. And we can go double check that this is the right bit field, but that's exactly what we want. So, you know, at startup, right, like when we're actually doing the initial code here, um, we probably want to, to just throw this in there as something we do when things get started, right? So like right here, we would wanna do um, mm get CSR, which, okay, it looks like it's an unsigned int. Um, so this is the old control bits here. And then we get these from the, uh, from the actual intrinsic, it will return what the floating point unit is set to do well, unit, the multiple floating point execution ports are set to do. Um, we can then just or it in. Like so. Um, and then we can do an MM set CSR with the new control bits, right? And what we want to do is we want to actually go look and see what these bits actually are because I don't know, like that, you know, who knows, that person's posting on a form, they could have had a typo, you know, we don't know. Um, but I'm curious to see, like, to what extent we can get that to actually do something. Now, in this case, it looks like it didn't do anything at all, right? This is still quite slow, right? Um, so let's take a look at what actually happens in here. I also don't know if we do set CSR anywhere in the code, so I want to look and make sure that we don't do that elsewhere. Okay, we don't. So at startup, if we set these up properly, hopefully that would be fine. Now we don't actually know because someone else could come along and set them. So another way to look at this is maybe we should call them every time. And then let's take a look at what the control bits should actually be. So if we go to the, um, the control bits for this, if we look for flush to zero, um, I wanna kind of look at, I mean, I guess we could look at what these values are, right? Um, but I kind of want to look to see what these are in the actual programming guide, right? Like, I would like to know, um, we had somewhere we were sticking this stuff. There it is. <clears throat> so if I look at the actual Intel architecture manual here, 
Um, oh, you know what? Didn't I do this? Yes. Um, so if I look at the Intel architectural manual and I just look at the like CSR, um, I'm just curious, like, okay, well, that's not very helpful now, is it? That's the the wrong state. Um, here we go, here we go, here we go. All right. So here's a bunch of stuff. Uh, we've got denormal operation mask. We've got flush to zero, um, underflow and overflow, divide by zero, like all this stuff. To be honest, like probably we want two sets of things. We're going to want to knock stuff out here as well as put stuff in. And I guess we have to kind of look. So flush to zero flag provides a means of controlling underflow conditions on SIMD floating point operations. Conservation can be loaded from memory, blah, blah, blah. Bit 1631 are reserved. We don't really probably need to look at those. Um, so if we actually look at these in here and we look at which bits are being set, so flush to zero is like bit 15, right? Um, and so you can see that that was the eight here um, because here's bits one through four, here's bits, I'm uh, sorry, zero through three, here's bits four through seven, here's bits eight through 11, and here's bits 12 through 15, and 15 is set. Now, I would rather do something like this. So that people know what the heck is going on when they look at this code, right? <clears throat> um, the precision mask, I don't know what that does because I've long forgotten. So it would be nice if it were documented. So seven through 12, we want to clear because we don't want any exceptions to occur. So seven through 12, we want to be empty. That's this mask. So that's invalid operation, denormals, whatever. We want those cleared, right? Um, so denormals are zero, we want set, which is bit six. That was the four. Wait. But four would be wrong, wouldn't it? Also, bit six, this is the wrong way to write this. So bit six would be shifted up five, right? Um, yeah, so anyway. Invalid operation flag, denormal flag, divide by zero flag, underflow flag, and, uh, sorry, overflow flag, and underflow flag, and precision flag. These are just things get that are set when they happen, right? Um, so this is, this is just for detection. So those <clears throat> should all be zero, and we don't want to touch those anyway, because those are just conditioned. Like, that just tells you something. Six we want to set. 7 through 12, we want clear. Rounding control, we probably do actually want to set it to our rounding. And then flush to zero, we want to set. We should probably set the RC as well, right? Um, but what we probably want to do here is actually say, like, old control bits. Um, we want to do, like, and control mask. So we want to knock out, like, the bits that we want cleared. And then we want to, like, you know, desired bits. We want, like, desired Right. Uh, so we want like our control mask in this case uh, we want that to be like all the bits we actually care about so um, of all the bits we know about here let's define them all um, so we want like precision mask
underflow mask, overflow mask, divide by zero, denormal. and invalid. Yeah. So if we take a look at these just in the Intel bit order, we've got flush to zero, we've got rounding control. Um, and rounding control is a little bit squinky because it's actually two bits, right? So it's actually two bits that are both set together. And then it starts at 13, right? Um, yeah, so I don't, why did I change the 14? That's correct. So if it was set at one and zero, right? If this was set to one, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Am I right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Yeah, so I was right. I don't know why I was thinking that because it's already shifted down. If it was 16, if you were counting the bits, then it would have been one less, but it's not here. Um, and do normals are zero, should be six, yeah. Right, I think I'm right there. So we don't care about zero, one, two, three, four, or five. We care about six and then seven is the invalid op. Denormal mask is eight. Denormal op mask rather is eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And then we've got 13 and 14 here and 15. Um, so then our control mask is just all of these. So this is the flush to zero bit, the rounding control bits, the precision mask, the underflow mask, the overflow mask, the DBZ mask, the normal op mask, the invalid op mask, the normals are zero. That's all of the stuff that we want to talk about. So we want to knock them all out. Then we want to just put in the two we want, which are these two, right? Now for rounding control, Honestly, I think we might just not want to touch it right now. Let's just leave it as it is. So we'll knock out everything but that, and then we'll put in the two that we actually wanted, right? Now, I don't know if this is gonna help. Uh, we'll find out. We'll see what happens here, oops. Oh, and also, I guess, well, let's see. So we'll run it and we'll see if we stop. I'm guessing that maybe these mask values should actually be set to on because it's a mask. So it should be on if we want to stop them from occurring, right? So this should actually cause us to stop somewhere. Probably, I would think. Um, yeah, so, so that actually causes even the standard runtime library to cause an operation error, right? Okay, so actually we just want our control mask and our desired bits are actually the same in this case because we wanna set all of them, right? So it just so happens that it's the same, right? Which is kind of weird, um, but that's just how it is, right? At the moment. Uh, so now if we run, um, yeah, in theory we're setting correctly. So I have no idea where this slowdown is coming from. It's fascinating. I really don't know what's causing it to be slow. Um, it's some other thing that isn't related to the behavior of the CPU, I guess. And I don't really know, like, you know, I guess we could double check uh, that the MCR is actually being set properly, but that's just like really weird, right? It's just like really, really, really weird. Uh, and I have no idea why it's why it's having that problem. Uh, something super bizarre is happening. Um, if I actually just step into the code here, uh, I just want to look and see what we actually get. So here's the old control bits. 
uh, what we would actually get. And here's the new control bits. So it is actually the case that that those were not what was set, like meaning this is not the exact pattern. And it looks like specifically like the flush to zero was not set, for example, um, which is interesting. And the normals are zero was not set. So it's kind of a little bit weird that we didn't get more of a change in the program because of that. So it would have lined up with what we would have expected to see actually, um, believe it or not. But for whatever reason, that's not what happened. I'm gonna do something else here a little bit strange. I might put this at the top of the lighting code just so I can see w whether that gets reset uh, cause that would also be if someone else was resetting that without our permission, that would explain it too. So I just want to do it every frame to see if that's the case. Uh, so let's actually just dump that right here. Uh, yeah, where is that though? Okay, so what we should be able to verify here is that we always have the same one every time. Yeah, so so thankfully, like now we know it's running properly. Uh, we know that no one's like interceding and I'll double check to make sure that didn't like make it go fast all of a sudden, but I'm pretty sure it wouldn't because I don't think anyone would be monkeying with our settings there. Don't know, but I don't imagine so. Yeah, so you can see like it's just really weird. It's really slow and bizarre, and, and I have no idea why that would be because we don't have things that are really dependent on that, so I don't understand why we would be getting um, such a drastic difference in speed as a result of that. Um, but, you know, it could be other things. We haven't looked at it particularly closely. I am going to go ahead and keep this code because I do like the ability for us... Um, to have this code available. So I am gonna put in here a thing that's like, you know, uh, set default floating or uh, FP behavior. Some you can call just to make sure that all this stuff is set in a particular way. Um, and we'll do that just right at the outset. And that way we don't have to worry about it anymore. We know that no matter what we're, you know, however we're running, it'll, you know, should be roughly correct. And we could be more defensive and set it every frame if we feel like we should, but at the moment, you know, it's fine. So that's just so weird. So I have no idea what's going on here, but you know, that's a, a job for next weekend. We've at least got our Raycaster working properly, or at least to a certain extent, we've got it working properly. Um, and so we should be able to pick it up from there uh, next time around. Also, question. Um, we're still running single threaded. So that's probably where the speed problem was coming from now that I think about it. That was a slight mistake. Um, okay, so Actually, that that may have explained part of it, right? Um, so we still have the feedback problem, right? And if I get rid of those looks fishies here, Yeah, yeah, so let's do this test again. I bet it was the do normals, and I just forgot that I'd turn off the multi-threading. So let's go and look at the code for uh, the diffuse build, right? Oops. And let's look in here and say, okay, so if we go back to the previous values that we were using before where we got the instant explosion, which we know like just kills us uh, very quickly and, and we got the performance degradation that happened. Let's see if it still happens with the normal flushing turned on now, because this is the actual test. 
We need a frame counter. We should have a, a frame counter on here so we can see at which frame it happens. Um, and then like actually get a more coherent understanding of what's going on, right? I should, I should put that in here. So here's us running for a while, right? And we're not seeing any of, of the um, explosion till, oh, nope, there it is. Weird. That's just a bizarre one. I, I still I still have literally no idea what the, what could be causing that other than weird like values. Um, I just don't know, and I think we've said it now. I mean, I think we've said it so that that's not. Um, occurring i want to do one more thing now i'm going to actually call that every frame so i'm going to go in here and i'm going to call set default behavior i'm going to call that every frame so inside the lighting code uh i just i'm just curious because i don't know um before we do this in the update lighting call i'm just going to put it in here to like reset that right Uh, and then I'm going to let it run again uh, and look at that uh, perf. Because, again, I'm just not sure. I mean, for all I know, some driver jumps in and sets our denormal flushing off for some reason. And I just don't know, right? So I just want to find out if – I just want to be absolutely positive that it's not denormals or other types of overflow underflow problems occurring there. So it's oddly not as bad, but it seems to still have hit the problem. Oh, you know what? I just glanced at the chat and someone pointed out each thread can have this problem because if the MXCR is saved per core, which you would expect it to be doing in the OS, you'd have to set it for each one of those. So actually, we need to make sure that's true for everybody. So basically the MXCR should have to get set right at the code that actually uh, jumps in for compute work, right? Uh, uh, platform, oops, work queue callback. So right here, we actually need to make sure that we're flushing denormals to actually do this test for fairly, right? You know what, I bet that's totally it. That's a very good catch, chat. Whoever caught that, XX the big fox, totally right, totally right. I bet, I bet that's it, I bet that's it. It totally fits the behavior profile about how it wasn't going as high. That's probably as certain cores got their MXCR set, those cores dropped off of the slow path and back onto the fast path. I absolutely, I think that's totally true. So, excellent catch. That's almost certainly the case. I mean, we'll see. Maybe not, but pretty sure. Yeah, so that's... That's it. Okay. So thankfully, that's all now very explicable. It was, in fact, problems with denormals, which is what we'd expect. So that's great. This puts us in a fantastic position for next weekend um, because now we should be able to start working on the lighting quality transfer part of things and get a, a good solution, presumably out of the grid raycaster as well. So that's great.
Awesome. Oh, does someone want me to check the camera? Uh, the ca but we didn't need to do that, right? Before, like, we were able to get it to repro with just the camera sitting in one place. So the camera is not involved here. Cool, cool. Excellent catch, chat. Excellent, excellent catch. Um, all right. Let's go ahead and uh, I guess we'll go to brief, brief Q&A, but... So, no, we don't really take too much of a look at how, uh, so the question is, I'm building my first BVH for my ray tracer to the previous episodes where you work on a KD tree, going to how to traverse the tree using SIMD without slamming your face into the wall nose first. Uh, no, because there isn't one really. So the way that that typically gets handled in the uh, performance oriented literature, as far as I know, uh, is all they do is try as hard as possible to bundle rays together, which they think will need to traverse roughly the same part of the BBH, right? So basically, like, if you have a bounding volume hierarchy, what you generally know is like, look, if I'm shooting rays in sort of similar directions, they probably have to visit roughly the same set of nodes. So that should minimize the amount of additional visitation that I do as I go through the tree, right? That tends to be what they do. Now, more aggressive work in this area can do slightly different things. Um, but that's most of it, right? If you have the luxury of using scatter gather, the other thing, like, cause AVX has scatter gather in it. If you're using AVX two, I think has scatter gather in it. AVX 512 does. I don't know if two does. Uh, it's the Intel chips are so confusing as to what they have and don't have. But if you have the luxury of using scatter gather, you can also try to do things where you go, look, I'm going to load different bounding volumes right into my different registers. You can do stuff like that, right? You can make bounding volume hierarchies where you're like, well, I scatter gather different stuff. So rather than testing against, you know, testing four rays against one volume, you test four rays against four volumes all of a sudden. And that, so, so each ray is actually in a different node of the BVH. And then you're in a better position because then you don't really care whether or not all your rays are in the same part of the BVH. You care whether all your rays have to visit roughly the same number of nodes in the BVH. And that's an easier thing to work on, right? So... Can you c explain more why denormals could cause performance to degrade? Uh, no, <laughs> actually I can't. Um, I've never looked, so I have no idea why. A chip designer would be able to tell you. My understanding is that in the actual hardware, when a denormal occurs, it actually gets shunted to a literally slower hardware path. That's, that's all I know. So I don't really know 
why they're... I don't really know why they actually cause performance problems um, at the chip level, but, you know, you can sort of see why, because if all of your operations, if you design this really fast hardware that's based around processing things as exponent mantissa all the time, and all of a sudden you get thrown this this value that's like, not that at all. I mean, it makes sense, right? Uh, it, it, it makes sense that that becomes a thing you have to, that, that your ship is not optimized for, right? Because you can't possibly do that operation as fast as you were doing all the other operations, so now it's going to shut down. I don't know actually why, but it, you know, it's at least intuitive that that would be the case. It doesn't run contrary to what your thought process would be if you didn't know anything about hardware, which I don't. It, it makes sense, right? It's just, it's kind of logical. It's a number formatted in the bits totally differently than it, it is in every other case. And if, generally speaking, most of your computations occurred with denormal numbers, then you could say, well, probably we should have just designed the hardware to be fast for the normals, and they should run at the same speed as everything else, and the other things should slow down if necessary to like be the same speed as denormals, because this is what we should have my ship for. But most of your computations aren't denormal, so that wouldn't make much sense. Right? The volatile portion consists of the six tests. Oh, yeah. So flush to zero once per thread should be enough if the calling convention is obeyed, but you don't know that it is, right? Like a driver could just set that and forget to unset it, and then you'd be screwed, right? Can you put the code back up where you set the bits? We should probably set the rounding control <clears throat> um, because we might as well, now that we're setting it, set it to the thing we know it should be rather than relying it being on the default because why bother? But we're not doing that yet. Would it be worth special casing the occurrences when array runs parallel to the grid of the walk table? Um, I don't see why we would do that. I'm not sure what that would save. Do you think GPUs would have the denormalized issue? Gosh. I mean, that's so far afield from what I work on, I guess I don't know. So certainly GPUs in the early days would never have a denormal issue because they just wouldn't have support in the hardware for denormals at all, right? So, I mean, I'm pretty sure that the early at least the early GPU hardware would just be like, screw it. You give me a D normal and just you get whatever you get, man. Um, I don't think they would detect and process D normals at all. They probably wouldn't even throw exceptions. They would just literally just do whatever the bits would have come out. If you didn't think about D normals at all, right? You just get that answer. And so the reason that I hesitate to say that's what would happen today is because nowadays GPUs to a large extent are targeting scientific computing as a main uh, source of high margin revenue. Like NVIDIA loves to sell cards to you know, government entities doing nuclear simulation or 
big data mining, you know, whatever the heck. And denormals were specifically in there for the purposes of getting more precise scientific computations. I mean, that's the only reason they exist in the first place. So I guess what I would say is I'm not prepared to say that modern GPUs wouldn't actually handle denormals. They might. I would assume, and it's purely an assumption, I'm just going on interest. I have no idea. I can't answer your question. But if I had to guess at the answer, my guess would be that unless you were specifically running like a CUDA path or some other kind of scientific computing path, that the GPU would be automatically configured by the graphics driver not to use denormals, even if the GPU can handle denormals. That would be my expectation because graphics drivers are all about performance and the last thing they would want to do is by default give developers a way to make them slow by accidentally passing too small a numbers, right? So my assumption would be that specifically, unless you ask a GPU to do denormal conformant operations, they won't, but I actually don't know because I've never looked. All right, last question. I came from day 523 and that's, oh, you're sort of talking about the um, joke intro to Git. Uh, So I don't know what to say about stuff like that. Um, I think Git is just a pile of crap. I mean, it's, uh, you know, Git, Git is, is not good. Sorry, folks. It's, it's terrible, right? Now, that's not the same as saying that some of the core ideas in Git are bad because, you know, using hashes to identify files is not necessarily a bad idea, especially if you use a better hash than Git used. Um, having peer-to-peer -peer support in your source code control system is not a bad idea, right? So it's not that some of the ideas in Git weren't good. The current incarnation of Git is, is absolutely terrible. And I don't actually know why any sane programmer wouldn't agree with that. They obviously don't because tons of people like defend Git and tell you to use it. But Git is absolutely horrible. It is not a good source code control system. It is dramatically overcomplicated for what it does. The default things it does are usually not what you want. It requires way too much specialized knowledge of how it works to be effective with it. It's just very bad. So it should absolutely never have been the standard source code control utility, but a lot of things I just said can be said about a lot of source code control utilities. They tend to be pretty bad. So at the same time, it's like, it's not like there was some amazing source code control utility that people just didn't use because Git was there. Um, so you could think of the standardization of Git being people picking an incredibly bad option from a field of incredibly bad options. And at that point, you know, what are you going to say? Um, and you know, the thing you say is, is Linus Torvalds not a good programmer as a result of that? No. Linus Torvalds didn't write most of Git. Probably the initial simple thing that that uh, that Linus Torvalds wrote was probably good because Linus Torvalds is a good programmer in my opinion. Um, obviously, that's just a matter of opinion, but like I think he is. But Git today is nothing like that. There are so many lines of code in Git, in a standard distribution of Git right now, that Linus Torvalds hasn't even read them, let alone did he write them. So Git is nothing like what he wrote originally. It's not even, you know, 10% Linus. It's like 0.1% Linus. 
and 99.9% a bunch of really crappy programmers who like piled on top afterwards, right? I mean, for that matter, so is the Linux kernel, right? Like, if the Linux kernel sucks, and I'm not saying that it does, but if it did, it's not because Linus Torvald is a bad programmer. That is, those things do not follow, even a little bit, right? Because you're talking both Git and the Linux kernel are many millions of lines of code, and he didn't write them. Anyway, so that's my opinion on Git. And Linus Torvalds, who I think is a very good programmer, personally. Um, I, I don't know how you pronounce his name, but my understanding is it would be like Linux and Linus. As close as possible, not Linus. I feel like Linus is more of an American pronunciation. Um, so it's more like Lee than Lie. Um, but I don't know any Northern European languages at all, let alone um, uh, Finnish, let's say, or I don't know what the correct pronunciation would be. Let's put it that way. Um, so I guess what I would say is go listen to him pronounce it and that's how you pronounce it. more Swedish than Finnish? I, like I said, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, because again, just because someone's from a particular country doesn't mean their name is actually that, right? For example, my parents are both Italian. My first name is Irish, <laughs> right? So the pronunciation of Casey has nothing to do with where I was born or who my parents were or what their native language was or what their ethnicity even was. So, you know, how you pronounce someone's name is difficult to say. I have no idea how you're supposed to pronounce Linus. I just pretty sure it's not Linus is, I guess, the only thing I can say, because that's a pretty specific pronunciation of that name that I don't think would apply anywhere he's from or where his parents were from. I, I just don't think you would ever say Linus. I could be wrong, though. All right, let's wrap it up. And my goodness, I didn't realize anyone could actually watch that video that I did about Git and not know that it wasn't fake. But the fact that you didn't know it wasn't fake is a pretty good indication of why I think it's pretty definitive to say that Git is not a good source code control system. The fact that that is sort of what it feels like to use Git is just a really good example of why this is not really what you want. And the reason that I say that is because it's very important to understand one very crucial feature of source code control systems. And that is that any time, literally any time that you spend interacting with your source code control system is time you aren't spending programming. That means that everything Everything, 100% of the time that you spend learning a source code control system and using a source code control system is wasted, period. So the entire job of a source code control system author, interface designer, whatever you want to call it, is to figure out how to create the most amount of useful source code control operations out of the simplest possible amount of user work and education. And there's like no question that Git absolutely failed at that. 
because not only can it not do most things, so most of the things you would want a source code control system to do, such as, for example, only store large binary older versions on specific machines. That's a very obvious, it's the first thing I put in my source code control system, for example. Uh, Git can't even do. You have to start using these new updates to it called large file system awareness. Or I, there's all this crap people have added only in the last few years to do that. It's not even part of the system, right? Um, so Git has a very narrow set of things you can actually do. They mostly uh, relate to basically um, creating lots of different in-place hash versions of things and sending those around between different people. That's like almost all it can do. And yet the syntax and the amount of education you need to actually understand what is happening in it, its output, and how to fix or diagnose problems is tremendous. Um, most people have no idea how to use most things in Git. Most people can easily create errors when they're using Git and not really understand why. It's a terrible source code control system. I'm sorry, it just, it is. Objectively, on any axis you want to measure it, it's really, really bad. The only axis you could say it succeeds on is obviously its ability to work distributed is good um, because it allowed people to do that. And that was a pretty good improvement um, that was worth making, but it's not, good. it's not a good implementation of that. It's a bad implementation of that, right? Um, so no, and I also disagree. If you say it's not wasteful if your job is to integrate patches from hundreds of branches from thousand developers day in and day out, no, that's false, right? The job is integrating the patches, not working with the source code control system, right? So the idea there is it should have been the most, you, you're trying to design a, a system where the programmer does the least amount of work to review and commit the correct set of branches into their project, right? If any work that you're doing in that system that involves you interacting with the source code system is wasted, ideally you wouldn't do it at all. You'd just be presented with changes and you'd approve or deny them, right? That'd be the best possible outcome. It would just be directly in your editor and that's what would happen. And you'd never even know there was a source code control system, right? You'd just be like, here's a change from Bob. Do you like that or not? And I'd be like, oh, hmm, I don't know, let me build it, okay. Uh, no, I don't deny, right? And I'd never even, I'd never have to learn anything, right? I mean, that's, that's what you would want. You would want a system where you never even knew that there was source code control, right? The less you even ever were aware that there was source code control, the better. And any time you're thinking about source code control as part of your job, that's just a failure of the system. I mean, that's pretty much all you can say, right? And it's not to say that we had better systems. That's why I say like Git, if you evaluate it against other source code systems, it's not necessarily terrible because there's lots of bad source code control systems there. Early isn't like some amazingly fantastic source code control system out there. But like, it's not good. You know, it's not it's not a good thing that you have to spend all this time typing in all these esoteric Git commands. That's that's just not something to be proud of, right? Like it's like, no, this is terrible. We really want something much better than this, right? I mean, that's just if you really want an example of how bad Git was, you know, I've used it like once or twice total um i mean unless you count typing git clone to get things occasionally right but like you know we were at alan's house me and alan were at his place working on four coder together right and i wanted to do an incredibly simple operation i just wanted to, i don't remember exactly what it was it was like i just wanted to get like the thing that alan had done and i wanted to transfer it into my thing or something right and we had even, we had Git experts on the stream and they were like, yeah, you can't, you can't do this thing you wanted to do. 
It was like incredibly simple. I don't remember what it was. It was like super, super simple, but like Git can't do it. You had to go through like these, uh, oh, one thing I could have done was installed a Git extension to do it though, <laughs> which was amazing, right? And you're just like, come on. You know, this is a joke. Git, Git is not good. It's, it's, it's really quite poor. Um, it's, it's not a good abstraction over the set of things that a version file system can do. Let's just get over it. It's not good. There'll be something 10 times better than Git someday. There just will be. Like, it's not, it's not good for what it does. It's, it's quite poor. Which we just, I use a, we have a custom one at Molly Rocket. It's called Seamer. Um, it's not great. Uh, I kind of have plans for a great one that, you know, is sort of the next incarnation of it. Seamirror is like the second incarnation. There was a Seamirror 1. It was kind of crappy. Seamirror 2 is actually pretty good, but I learned a lot about what is possible with source code control in Seamirror 2. And I realized some really important things about it. And I was like, oh, duh. There's all these things we're not doing in source code we could easily do. And I did some of them in Seamirror 2, but now that I know what they all are, I think Seamirror 3 will be probably when I'm capable of saying, okay, this is now actually great. Seamirror 2 is not great. It's like good, but bad at some things for no reason. So I think Seamirror 3, you know, All right, that's it. I'm going to call it. Too many windows open. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you would like to follow along the series at home, you can always head on over to handmadehero.org and pre-order the game. It comes with the source code, so you can follow along with it at home. Uh, we're all done with the main raycasting debug process because I think we've kind of gotten it working fairly well now. And so now what we have to do is actually go work on the lighting transfer stuff, which we may have some bugs that we introduced in the latest round. But even if we don't have bugs there, we also know that we never really did the lighting quality pass that we need to do. So starting next week, we'll probably head into that. Uh, where we just start to look at really what what are we transferring around for fundamental qu quantities? How are we transferring them? And how do we make sure that they start stay properly unbiased so we don't get fade to white or fade to black, which are the two things that happen when you've got a feedback loop in the lighting, right? That's it uh, for today. Hope to see you back here next week. Till then, have fun program, everyone, and I'll see you on the internet. I'm going to check to see if John's still streaming, and if he is, we will go ahead and raid. So don't touch that. Don't touch that dial or whatever. Let's see. Is John still on? Is he on? Tell me if John is streaming. Mr. Raid System. Yes, he is. So we're going to head over and and uh, raid John's channel. I don't know what he's doing right now, but it's probably something cool. So here we go. All right, folks, here we go.